Hello again, and welcome to the Percussive Arts Society's Summer 2023 Friday Fundamentals series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's clinician, Michaela Phillips. Michaela is currently pursuing a DMA in percussion at the University of North Carolina Greensboro and has a master's in music from Indiana University. They're an avid proponent of new music and an expert on hand drumming, which is the subject of today's fundamental session. Michaela will be presenting a clinic titled Hand Drums for Beginners, and will be covering fundamentals for congas, djembe, and bongos. On behalf of PAS and the Education Committee, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Hey everybody, my name is Michaela Phillips, and I'm so excited to talk to you today a little bit about hand drums. Today we're going to be covering some djembe techniques, congas, and bongo techniques. Let's start by talking a little bit about the history of these instruments. So, the djembe has origins in modern-day Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, or the Ivory Coast, Gambia, and Senegal. In approximately the 12th century, the Mandinka people are credited with creating this instrument. The congas and the bongo have a little bit later of origins in the 19th and early 20th century in the country of Cuba. In terms of congas, you might see a lot of different names for them, especially if you're playing different styles of music whether it be folkloric or popular, you might see congas referred to with a variety of different names. So oftentimes you'll see congas in groups of three, a high drum, a middle drum, and a low drum. The high drum is sometimes called the quinto, the kachimbo, or the nino. I have a quinto right here. The middle drum is sometimes just referred to as a conga, tres golpes, tres por dos, segundo, or mula. The low drum, or the low conga, is sometimes called a tumba or a tumbadora, a salidor, or a caja. So let's talk a little bit about how we set up to play our instrument. For congas and djembe, they have a very similar setup. The angle of the drum and the body is what we're going to talk a little bit about first. First, we want to angle the drum forward so that it's facing away from us and not towards us. And this is similar to how you might set up on a concert snare drum. Again, it's similar because we don't want the angle of the wrist to inhibit our ability to play and inhibit our technique. So if the drum is angled towards me, it's going to be difficult for me to get the angles of my wrist to where I need them to be to play comfortably and without injury. So I'm going to take the drum and instead of having it flat on the floor, I'm going to angle it a little bit forward. This is going to help with two things. First, it's going to help me with my wrist orientation, which needs to be straight and engaged. It's also going to help the bottom of the drum resonate a little bit more so that there's an opening at the bottom. When we're playing conga and djembe, the angle of our wrist is going to determine the sound and the tone of our stroke. So this is super important to start our students off for success. This might be similar to how you set up your embouchure on your wind instruments or your bow hold on your string instruments. Another item that's incredibly important to instrument setup on both congas and djembe is the height of the seat that you're sitting on. If you're able to, find an adjustable height seat and this is going to create more opportunity for you to get the perfect fit for your students or yourself. So right now I'm sitting on a drum set stool, which is nice because I can change the height. I can go up and down until I find the perfect spot. Obviously, this is going to be different for every single person because everyone's body is a little bit different. What we want to go for is to have separation between the chest cavity and the elbow here. So we have some space and we're not too scrunched up or too far away. So just nice and relaxed. And then also we want to be able to put our wrists and our arms on the drum without having to over pronate the shoulders or without there being a bend in the wrists. We want to have a straight set up with a straight line going from our middle finger all the way to the tip of our elbow. Once you find your height, a little low for me, then we have a really nice setup so we're set up for success and to start with our first tones. For the bongo, the angle of the drum and the setup of the body is very different. The bongos are going to be held between the legs with the high head, or the macho, being held up against the left leg, and the low head, or the himbra, being held against the right leg. The seat height generally needs to be much lower in order to play comfortably. The strokes are going to be with smaller portions of the hand than with the conga and djembe strokes that we're going to learn momentarily. Here's a quick example of what these strokes might look like on the bongo. While this video is too short to explore these modified techniques in depth, this quick example shows that the playing technique and approach to the smaller instrument varies greatly from the congas and the djembe. So 
Put it on our bongos, I have them in between my legs here. And for all of these strokes, instead of using my whole hand on the head, I'm going to use a smaller portion of my hand and move the hands back so we get a smaller playing zone on our hands. And that'll get us a more characteristic sound. some of those tones, there are two important vocabulary terms you need to know. The very first is contact point. And contact point means wherever on our hand we're going to make connections with the head of the drum. And just as a refresher, the head of the drum is either the plastic or animal skin thing that's stretched over the shell of the drum that makes that tone that we all know. Second is the bearing edge. And so this is where that head that we just talked about comes in contact with the shell of the drum. And so on the snare drum right here, the bearing edge is in between the rim and the head. For my conga here, we don't have a rim that's up, but it's further down. We have a hoop and our bearing edge is right here. This is going to be really important in defining where you put your hand and where to place your hands. If you end up teaching these concepts to younger students, make sure these students know these terms first before you even begin to play. Oftentimes, students will be very excited to hit drums and to play hand drums. It's super fun. But as you might have found out if you've ever tried to sit in and play congas or djembe's before, it might hurt your hands if you don't know what you're doing. So make sure your students know these terms so you can teach them appropriately. So next, let's go through the essential tones. The open tone, muffled tone, slap tone, and bass tone. Today we're going to start with the open tone. This might be similar to starting with long tones on your wind or brass students. So the open tone is going to be set up very similar to how we set up earlier in the video. We want our wrists to be straight, our fingers to be together, and the contact point to be the middle part of the fingers, as seen on the diagram here. We're going to initiate the stroke and move mostly from the wrist, and we're going to rebound off the head, so no dead strokes. Here's what a couple of open tones look and sound like. need to lift the non-playing hand off of the drum to let the drum resonate. If I have my non-playing hand resting on the drum, we get a muffled sound. It's not a bad sound, but not the sound that we're looking for for the open tone. In order to make our open tone, we're going to start with what I like to call the triangle or the Hershey's Kiss. And we're going to take that triangle and place it on our drum head right in the middle. And now for this stroke, for the open tone, we're going to take that triangle and we're going to move it back towards our body so that our knuckles are over this bearing edge that we just learned about. So our knuckles are over the bearing edge. And then we're going to split the triangle or the Hershey's Kiss apart a little bit so that our hands are a little more separated and have freedom to move. Now we're going to keep our wrists straight and our fingers together in one unit. And we're going to bring them down so that our contact point is the middle part of the fingers. We're going to move and initiate the stroke from mostly the wrist and we're going to rebound the stroke off of the drum. Here's what that looks like. Now, if you're struggling to keep your wrist straight, you might get a sound that sounds a little bit higher and might be inconsistent. I'm going to move my wrist down and I'll let you hear what that sounds like. If you hear that higher pitch sound, then that means that you don't have the straight wrist implementation that we talked about earlier. So again, to get that open resonant tone, we want our wrists to be straight and initiate that stroke from the wrist. Next, we're going to cover the muffled stroke. There are a couple of different terms for this stroke. Muffle is the one, or muff is the one that I use the most often. You might hear muted stroke or other terms as well. So most of the technique here is going to be exactly the same. We can find our triangle, bring it down on the drum, move our knuckles over the bearing edge, and keep our fingers together as a unit. The only thing that's going to change here is that we're going to have no rebound. And so, for instance, our non-playing hand can just chill where it is. And that's because the sound that we're going for is muffled or closed instead of open and resonant that we just learned about. 
So the muffled tone looks and sounds like this. Again, our muffled tone has no rebound and is closed and short. Oftentimes, beginners will think that the muffled tone needs to be reserved and quiet and gentle. However, most of the time when the muffled tone is used in Afro-Cuban music, it's going to be strong and often leading us into some sort of release or accent. So, when you're playing your muffled tones, think about instead of lightly touching the drum and being gentle, think about using a higher velocity or speed and accelerating as you go towards the head. So let's hear what some of those accelerated, strong muffled tones sound like. The next stroke that we're going to learn is the bass tone. Unlike the open and muffled tone, we're going to use the entire palm of the hand, and we're going to start to involve the arm in our stroke. As you might have guessed, the bass tone is the lowest tone in pitch of all the tones that we're going to learn. We're going to start with both hands completely flat on the drum head. We're going to try and keep those fingers mostly together. We don't have to squeeze them together too tight to where we get white knuckled, and we definitely don't want them too splayed out. We want the hand to be one full unit, kind of like we're using a bass drum mallet. So we've got both of our hands flat on the head of the drum. Our fingers are mostly together, and make sure the palm is flat too. We don't have any cup action going on where there's an air pocket underneath. So we have full contact on the drum head. Now, when I teach bass tones, especially to younger students, I like to tell a story so that they can understand the type of stroke they need to get. I know this is going to be a little silly, but just go with me. So for the bass stroke, I like to think about us all being little marionette puppets. There's a giant robot in the sky, and the robot has all of our wrists tied up with string. And so we're just going around our lives with our robot controlled arms. Just roll with it, I promise. And so someday someone comes along and just snips the string of our robot controlled arms and they just fall down. Now this story might seem silly, but it helps students think about the type of velocity and weight and use of gravity we need in order to accomplish the bass tone. So our bass tone is going to initiate from the wrist, moving the wrist upward. I like to think of it as like a serpent that might strike, or you can think T-Rex arms too. And then, just like that marionette we talked about earlier, all of the weight of our arm is going to be in the air and then dropped. What most beginners will lean into doing is instead of using the weight of their arm to do the work, they're just gonna place their arm down gently. As you can probably hear, it's a really big difference in our sound. Again, not a bad sound, but a sound that we don't necessarily want for our bass tone. We want the bass tone to be strong and low and full. So let's hear what our bass tones might sound like. So notice that I'm using all of the weight of my arm, and even though this is my highest drum here, I can still get a low, grounded sound with our bass tone. Last and most importantly with the bass tone, make sure to relax and let go. Our last stroke that we're going to learn today is the slap stroke. Now, if you know anything about hand drumming, this one might be the most intimidating to you. But I promise the slap stroke will come to you just as easily as the three prior. So, let's start again with our triangle. We're going to place that triangle in the middle of the drum again. And we're going to move our hands back. Instead of going where the knuckles were over the bearing edge before for the open and muff, we're going to go a little bit further in so that the middle line of our hand or our palm, some people refer to this as the lifeline, is over that bearing edge. And as before, we can split that triangle apart. Now next is going to be something new that we haven't done before. I'm going to let my thumbs relax, and most importantly, I'm going to take my wrist and I'm going to break it or relax it. So now that I've relaxed my wrist, you can see that I have a pocket open between my palm and the drum head. So again, I'm going to show you what that looks like from the top. Take our triangle, put it back on the drum head, we can separate the hands first this time, and move our hands over the bearing edge 
or that lifeline is over the bearing edge. Relax the thumbs and then relax the wrist or break the wrist. And now you'll notice that there might be a slight curve to the hand. Oftentimes many beginners will think, oh, I see someone who can get a slap and they curve their hand, so I'm going to try and curve my hand. I would encourage you to avoid trying to make a cuffed or curved shape with your hand because similar to the base stroke, we want this to be super relaxed and free going. If we try to create that cup shape too much, we're not really going to get the sound that we want. So speaking of, let's try and identify the sound that we want for a slap. First, we want it to be high in pitch. So this is the highest pitch of our tones. Secondly, we want it to be short staccato and we want it to be snappy and clear. So here are a couple of slap tones and what they might sound like. Notice that now my wrists are bent and relaxed. My fingers are naturally curved instead of artificially curved. The middle of my palm or my lifeline is over that bearing edge. And the contact point, the most important thing, is going to be the finger pads. Notice I didn't say the tips of the fingers, but the pads themselves. Right? So if you're going to get your fingerprints taken, it might be that area of the finger and not the tip. When I teach this concept to younger students, I often refer to the Spider-Man crawl, how Spider-Man might crawl up a building. That same area of the finger is going to be our contact point for our slap tone. So again, our finger pads are going to be coming in contact with the head. And oftentimes, I like to think of the slap as a mousetrap. It's coming down fast and accelerating, and then resting on the head. Notice that we're not rebounding any of these strokes. Our fingers are resting on the head. Now, this is the common technique for congas. However, if you switch to djembe, it's characteristic to have those slaps rebound off of the drum. Those are often referred to as open slaps. So here's my djembe, and notice how my setup is very similar to my conga. However, I have my legs crossed around the body of the drum at the bottom. That might look like this. So let's check in with our djembe and see how similar or different those tones are. First, our open tone is going to be very similar. Most of the tones on the djembe are going to be more open and off of the drum instead of laying into the drum. Next are slaps, which on djembe are going to be all open most of the time. Our slaps on djembe look and sound something like this. Next, our bass tones are going to rebound off the drum instead of laying into the drum like they do on congas. Here are some bass tones. Here's a player's view of how these strokes might look on the djembe, starting with the open tone, then slap, bass, and muffle. Notice how they are similar to the conga strokes and technique, but are often off or rebounded off of the drum head. Sometimes on congas, if we have a lot of slaps in a row, especially at a high speed, we might have to change them from close to open. This is an example of what that might sound like. So as I got faster, I had to open those slaps up because it became not so idiomatic to play those slaps closed at a fast speed. As a final review before we put them all together in our first exercise, here are the conga tones we've learned so far from the player's view, starting with the open tone, then slap, bass, and muffle. Pay close attention to how the contact points and playing areas shift from stroke to stroke. So now that we know all of our main tones on the conga and the djembe, let's try and put them together in an exercise. So we're going to start here with an alternating eights exercise. This might be similar to something you've done in drumline or taught to your drumline students. 
So we're going to start with alternating eighth notes on our open tone, then alternating eighth notes on our muffled tone, then our slap tone, and then ending with our bass tone. Let's try it together, and we're going to repeat each measure one time. Here we go. Opens, muffled, slaps, and then ending on our basses. Let's try it together. One, two, and one, and two, and here we go. To the muffle. To the slap. To the bass. you completed your very first exercise in moving from tone to tone to tone, you might have realized, oh, this was much easier when I played each of the tones separate. And now as we start to put them together, it might be more challenging. So this might be a similar situation to your woodwind students having to change octaves or partials for your brass students. Might be easy to play really high or really low, but transitioning between might be more of a challenge. The same thing applies here on our conga and djembe tones. So as we do this exercise one more time, I want you to pay close attention to the transition points in between each measure. Are you getting a clear and consistent tone from the start of each measure, or are you taking a few beats to settle in? It's okay if you are, but keep your ears tuned in on your tones and see if you can make that transition a little more seamless this time. Let's do our alternating eights exercise one final time here. One, two, and one. Here we go. some of our extended and combination strokes. So the first and most common stroke that you might hear referred to is the heel toe stroke. This is what a heel toe looks like. Sometimes you might see it in common patterns on congas like the tune bow. super common on the congas and not as common on the djembe, but you might see it from time to time. So luckily for us, the heel is the same exact thing as the bass tone that we just learned a few minutes prior. Heel or bass, same thing. What makes it a heel is the stroke that follows after. So we're going to complete our bass tone, and then in order to make it into a heel and transition to our toe, we're going to pretend that someone has super glued our wrist down to the head of the drum. We're going to lift it from there. You can even wave, say hi, mom. And then we're going to bring our toe or our fingers down with velocity on to the drum head. Try that a few times on your own and see if you can get a strong sound from your toe. So our toe stroke is where we move our palm and fingers down as a full unit. Let's try a couple of heel toes together. Both hands are double stops, and we're going to go heel, toe, heel, toe. Let's try eight of those together, nice and slow. One, two, and here we go. Heel, heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe. Nicely done. So, on the concert snare drum, for instance, if I play a double stroke, or two strokes with one hand. As I do those two strokes together and I speed up my tempo, I'm going to transition from two single independent strokes to one single double bounce. You might hear this referred to as getting two strokes for the price of one. A similar technique applies to the heel and toe stroke. As we start slow, notice how the heel and toe are two separate movements. As we start to speed up our tempo, the heel and toe are going to have to meld together a little bit 
as our tempo increases. So this is what that might look like. I'm going to do a pattern called chapateo, which means chopping. And this is going to be a common pattern that you'll see in a variety of Afro-Cuban music. All it is is alternating heels and toes on the right and left hand. I'm going to start my chapateo pattern nice and slow. And as I get faster, you'll see how that technique is going to shift into one motion in each hand. Here's the chapateo. single hand. We might start slow here. And as we get faster, notice how the rebound of my heel prepares us for a toe stroke. This is going to be an essential concept to master if you'd like to play patterns like tumbao at a faster speed. Here's a player's perspective of the heel toe stroke on the congas. let's do an exercise practicing those heel toes that we just learned. Let's first start with the heel toe fours. We're going to alternate our heel toes and we'll have something called a turnaround where we switch our sticking from right-handed to left-handed in the last beat of the first measure. Let's do it nice and slow together one time. One, e and da, two, e and da, ready and da, go. Thank you so much for joining me to learn more about the basic tones on the conga, djembe, and bongo. Thank you for watching, and thank you, Michaela, for your wonderful presentation. Be sure to join us next Friday when Jeffrey Berardin will be presenting our final session of the summer, a smashing success elevating your cymbal game. If you're interested in joining PAS or learning how you can contribute to the best musical community on the planet, head over to PAS.org today.